Hi, everyone. It's Hail Heidi. It's been a second. I don't think I've recorded for about two weeks. I am very happy to be back. I got sick while I was at Disneyland. I got influenza A. So I just have um, a leftover cough, um, even just touching my throat. I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> anyway, um, but doing so much better. So thanks, everyone, for being patient and for watching the videos while I was gone. I'm really excited to be back though. So today we are reacting to why Finland and Denmark are happier than the US. So <laughs> we will see um, what this video has in store. Granted, this is uh, two years long, two years long, two years old. It is not two years long. Um, but yeah, um, we are on a journey of learning more about in and outside of the, the United States. Um, I am from the United States, so this has been an amazing, very eye-opening journey. So thank you for being here today. Um, if you like the video, please like and subscribe. Come talk to me on Twitch when I get to streaming again. It's been about two, two weeks since then as well. Um, but it's fun over there too. So without further ado, let's do this. <laughs> what makes me happy is... I think I was definitely born happy, and then life happens. I'm getting a bit emotional here. <laughs> I feel very happy. Very happy. I'm happier now than when I lived in New York, and I got paid probably twice as much in New York as I do here. Our happiness is kind of like quiet happiness, kind of a stillness. What does it take to be happy? The Nordic countries seem to have it all figured out. Finland and Denmark have consistently topped the United Nations' most prestigious index, the World Happiness Report, in all six areas of life satisfaction. Okay, that will be interesting because I don't think I know the six areas. I don't think I'm familiar with that. It just hasn't, I haven't looked into that, I guess. <laughs> cool, this will, be, this will be awesome. How have they cracked the formula? And are the people there really the happiest? Good question. <laughs> the United Nations just named the happiest place on Earth. It is not Disney World. It's Finland. In 2019, <laughs> the World Happiness Report named Finland the happiest country in the world for the second year in a row. Denmark came in second place after claiming the top slot in 2013 and 2016. Year after year, Nordic countries like Norway, Iceland, and Sweden round out the top of the list. Enter Jeffrey Sachs, a professor at Columbia and the co-editor of the World Happiness Report. What do those countries have? They have a high level of prosperity to be sure, but they're not the richest countries in the world by any means. The idea is a good balance of life. You don't have to get super rich to be happy, they believe. In fact, if someone's super rich, they look, what's wrong with that person? Uh, so they're not societies that are aiming for all of the effort and time to becoming uh, gazillionaires. Uh, they're looking for a good balance of life and the results are extremely positive. That's interesting. Wait, I, I'd like to know more about what he was talking about. When someone is rich, people look and say, what's wrong with them? Wait, what does he mean by that exactly? Does he mean, oh, what's wrong with them? Why do they feel like they need to have this much money? Are they unhappy in other ways or something like that? That's a concept that I'm not familiar with. So I'm, what are your guys' thoughts on that? That's interesting. The annual happiness ranking began in 2012, but we can trace measuring happiness back to 1971. It came in the inspiration of the country of Bhutan, a country in the Himalayas that many people know for its innovation of attempting to measure gross national happiness. Globally, a standard for measuring success and productivity is gross national product. Bhutan had the bright idea of trying to measure happiness. Measuring happiness is a fairly complicated business. First of all, we need to understand what happiness means. It means the satisfaction with the way one's life is going. It's not primarily a measure of uh, whether one laughed or smiled yesterday, but how one feels about the course of one's life. Yeah. Meet Mike Viking. 
happiness researcher and CEO of the Happiness Research Institute in Denmark. There's a lot of factors that impact happiness, everything from you know, biology to income levels to the city they live in. But I think that the best predictor we see in the data of whether people are happy or not is whether they're satisfied or happy with their relationships. So, so do we have somebody we can rely yeah. on in times of need? Do we have somebody we can share our, our hopes and worries with? These six categories help account for the differences in life satisfaction around the world. GDP per capita, healthy life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, social support, generosity, and absence of corruption. On average, richer huh. countries are happier. On average, richer people are happier. But once we get to a certain level of income, additional $100 a month is not going to impact how people feel about their lives. So with money, like with everything else, we see diminishing marginal return. Interesting. I don't know why I'm bringing up this quote because it's extremely corny, but there is a Kanye West song uh, in which he says that uh, having money is not everything, not having it is. And I do think that's true in the sense that when you don't have it, it's all you worry about. And when you do have money, you can actually worry about other stuff. <laughs> happiness also seems like this elusive thing. We have two words for happiness in Danish. So we have lyke, which is the elusive thing, the thing you experience once every blue moon. And then we have to be glad, like the word glad, which is oh. different because it's more down to earth and you can be glad despite the fact that it's not anything special. It's no special day. Lyke seems like this elusive thing that you can't quite chase. To be glad is more like our mindset. So I feel more like I choose oh. to be glad at times rather than sort of trying to uh, chase happiness because that seems like it's never going to happen that way. Yeah, I think that that's true with anybody in any situation, I guess. Um, I feel like there are billionaires who are not happy. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that's pretty cool. I love that. <laughs> Maria lives in Helsinki with her husband, Duke, and her two-year-old son, Luca. Wow. Ah, uh -huh, yeah, there it is. There it is. <laughs> Precious. Finland is the best place to have kids. When you go give birth, it's almost free. We stayed in the hospital three full days. As a family, we had our own family room. and. I feel like actually three days is not very long still. So um, I wonder if it would have been more expensive if they stayed longer. Probably not. <laughs> the more that I'm, I'm learning about this kind of stuff. But yeah, that's pretty cool. And we got like meals and support and help and everything. And the bill was about 300 euros in the end. It's basically like oh, living in a hotel. In Finland, new mothers receive a free baby box jam-packed with 63 items to help with the baby's first year. You don't have to buy anything for the first two, three months. Of course, diapers and stuff like that, but basically. Right. And also, you can actually uh, put your baby to sleep in that box. Our baby actually, Luca, slept in the box for the first month. That's interesting! I know that, I don't know, tell me guys, um, if you live in Finland or anywhere nearby, do you guys have um, baby showers? Because we have baby showers before someone has a baby, you know, they invite all of their friends, all of their family, and people bring gifts for the first few years of, of the child. So they'll, they'll, you know, bring diapers, they'll bring um, clothing, <coughs> they'll bring, I don't know, cream for whatever, you know? Um, but a lot of mothers and a lot of parents depend on these baby showers kind of to like set them off in, in the first few years. So I wonder if Finland does that as well as kind of like receiving their first baby um, box or whatever they called it. Um, I'm curious, that's very interesting, so really cool though. Finland, along with the other Nordic countries, offers generous parental leave. Anu Partanen, author of The Nordic Theory of Everything, spent 10 years as a journalist in the US before returning to her home country, Finland. She's also a mother. In Finland, you get 10 months of paid parental leave. 
out of which about four months is set aside for the mother and, and you start it before the baby is born. And then father can keep nine weeks. Typically, both... Wait, 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 wait. So part of maternal leave is for before the baby is born? Do we do that much? We probably do a little bit. I feel like sometimes people just have to... No, I think that some people start their maternal leave or paternal leave a little bit before the baby is born, I think. But did how many months did they say? Wait a second. Did they say four months? Maternal leave, out of which about four months is set aside for the mother and, and you start it before the baby is born. And Four months before the baby? That's like half of the pregnancy. Is that common? Because holy cow, that is a long time for, for me at least, from, from what I understand um, of, like, parental leave. That is a long time. That would, that's amazing because there's a lot, I'm not even a parent, but from what I've seen, there is a lot to um, prepare for, you know? That's, people get so stressed right before, and you have this, this mother who is about to burst, and she's stressed because she doesn't have a crib yet and she hasn't bought enough diapers and she, she hasn't nested enough yet. And four months would be amazing for people to be able to have that time to prepare. Wow, that is cool. Anyway, love that. And then father can keep nine weeks. Typically, both parents stay home for the first three weeks. They share the rest of the time until the baby is nine months old. A parent can even stay home until the child is three years old and keep his or her job. However, the stipend is much smaller. Another determinant of well-being is one sense of personal freedom to make important life choices. Can you shape your life the way you want? Christina was unhappy at her job in advertising and took an eight-month break. Social security is also something I think is very important. What I did didn't make me happy and it, it didn't let me have that work-life balance that we cherish so much here. And so we have a system that made it possible for me to quit my job and have some thinking time and figure out, you know, what's my next step in life. Christina received about $2,000 a month from the Danish government while she was unemployed. She is now in school to become a painter. Her tuition is covered and she receives an educational stipend of about $1,000 a month. Oh my gosh. Guys, these videos never cease to just blow my mind. How am I not surprised? Like, how am I still surprised by things? Okay, that is incredible. I think that there are so many people who are not happy with their job, but they keep it. They keep it because what are they going to go? Where they're going to go? You know, how are they going to get their income? How are they going to survive if they take the time. So people are trying to take classes, they're trying to explore other things while they're trying to keep up with the job that they already have and that they are not happy with. That is so much. I know that that's something that my husband has been struggling with. He's, I mean, he he really, he likes his job, but he's been really wanting an education. He, um, you know, had to drop out of school for financial reasons, things like that. Anyway, um, but we've talked so many times about him going back to school, maybe taking one class. It's so expensive. And where is he going to find the time with the job that he already has? That is so cool that they have systems in place for people who need to figure things out. You know, love that. Ah, okay. I'm okay. <laughs> Two of the biggest perks of life in Denmark and Finland are free education and free health care. Income taxes are not at all as high in the Nordic countries that Americans tend to think. However, overall, it is completely true that the Nordic countries collect more taxes in general than the United States does. In Finland and the Nordic mm -hmm. countries, there are higher taxes on consumption, like eating in restaurants and buying jeans. But That's quite a bit. That's quite a bit more, you know. Sometimes we don't think about that, but I, I do think that it evens out in the end, but good to know, good to see it. The thing that I think a lot of Americans forget is that the Nordic people are happy to pay those taxes because they get services in return. Daycare, great public education, it includes your college, tuition free, it includes healthcare. All of those are included in your taxes. 
When the news hit that Finland is the happiest country in the world, I think most people kind of reacted to it like, what are they talking about? We don't think of ourselves as very happy because it's dark and gloomy in the winter and whatever. It's easier for Finns and Danes to shape their lives because the government supports so many of their basic needs. The American dream is probably more alive in Denmark. The perception of freedom is probably also a little bit different. It seems like in the US, the feeling is you have to be protected from the government and you have to have freedom from the government. I think in Denmark, the sense is that the government protects you. People trust other people. You leave a bag in a restaurant in Finland, you're pretty sure you're going to make it back and the money is still there. People even leave babies parked in strollers outside coffee shops while they run errands. Yeah, I've heard about this and that is unheard of in the US. Like there is no way you'd be reported. You know, someone would find the baby and be like, whose baby is this? And they'd they'd call the police or something. This is awesome. So cool. And I think partly the Nordic society cultivates that trust simply by providing basic services for everyone. So there's much less poverty, much less feeling of injustice, inequality, crime. People get the education they need. They can have a job. They can work. They don't have to struggle in life as much. There isn't super wealth and there's absolutely no super poverty. Everybody participates. It turns out it leads to a wonderful kind of life and one that is expressed year after year as uh, making these countries the happiest countries in the world. Monica and Alex are expats who live in Copenhagen with their two teenagers. Alex. Okay, really quickly, just before we go into the next thing, it is very interesting that here in the U.S. it is very, very, you know, looked down on to have to pay for someone else's shit, I guess. Um, people do not, for the most part, people are so against, you know, helping other people in society to not be on the streets, to actually get an education, stuff like that. Like, it's... It's so just people talk so negatively about that here that it's like, oh, my gosh, how can anyone do that? You know, I want to be able to own, you know, earn my own place, earn my own stuff. I don't want to have to pay more taxes than I need to or, you know, help other people who what are they even doing? You know, that is that's such a, a thing here. And it's it's very sad, honestly, like I think. I don't know. It's there's something just kind of peaceful about the way that the Scandinavian countries do this, you know? It's interesting. It's been interesting to learn about. So, anyway, Alex is originally from the UK and Monica is originally from New York. What else do you need? The olive oil and the balsamic vinegar. Where's the olive uh, oil? We originally came here expecting to stay only three years, but it was so good. We've been here nine now. It's also safe. And this comes back to the community and the trust. Uh, we can let our kids go out. And we do not have to sit here being really worried that are they going to come back? Are they safe where they're going? Do we have to go pick them up? We still worry, of course, but it's, it's just very different. There's still this very strong sense of family, friends, community. Balance is the formula for happiness. Aristotle had it right when he launched the study of happiness 2,300 years ago. According to Aristotle's golden mean, good behavior lies between two vices, excess and efficiency. People who pursue only money and say, I'll be happier the richer I am, turn out to be less happy. I do think having nice surroundings is a part of happiness, but I also think it needs to be linked with something that, that sort of resonates with you on a deeper level. Having nice surroundings and having a, a lot of money and being in a five-star hotel in Las Vegas doesn't make you happy at all. So I think it needs to have that balance. Cue the classic Nordic work-life balance. Rich Perusi, former New Yorker, has been living in Copenhagen for seven years. People stay pretty tight to a nine to five work day. But I do think that we get as much done in a, in a short period of time here as we, as we were doing in longer times working in New York. 
One of the comments we actually heard when we first came here was a, a Dane saying, that when you see someone working late, are they doing it because they can't get their work done? Is there something, something wrong with them versus are they just trying to get ahead and, uh, and working? There, there is a, a sense that, yes, work's important and you need to get your work done to a high quality, but you also need to make sure it's balanced uh, appropriately. Sara Alhupuro is a diplomat and an artist who has shaped her work schedule to make time for her passion. So I actually need to go to my physical workplace only only three days a week. So then the rest of the time I can I can spend here in the middle of nature. Oh. When I walk in the forest, I walk there very quietly, paying. Do you think she went to a forest kindergarten? I'm just saying. Maybe she didn't, so now she's making up for it. <laughs> attention to all the small details and all the colors very slowly and I try to spot all the small small details and I completely lose the track of time usually I spend about five to six hours picking mushrooms People don't make as much money in the Nordic countries as they do in the U.S. So it's not really about how much you make. You don't have to make as much to get the same quality of life as you would in the United States. Whoa! That's almost half as much. Is that what that's saying? Holy cow. Yeah, that's interesting. But I, I do think that things in the U.S. cost more. I don't know exactly, but interesting. So if we look at the dimension called life satisfaction, we can see that, that money does matter for well-being and happiness. But I mean, on average, richer countries are happier. On average, richer people are happier. But the mechanism here is being without money is a cause of unhappiness. Not everyone likes to talk about money either. In Finland, it's been this kind of rule that you don't talk about money that much, at least like my parents basically wouldn't tell me how much they made, for example, if I would ask as a kid. It would be considered bragging if you would tell about how much you make, etc. Hmm. People are happier when they are generous and when they feel that the society that they're in is a generous society. And then we find people want to live in places with decent government. If government is corrupt, if leaders are bizarre or autocratic or corrupt, the society is unhappy. In 2019, Finland elected the world's youngest serving prime minister, 34-year-old Sana Marin. Wow. Danes are among the happiest people in the world, but they're not necessarily the friendliest. Lars A.P., author of Effing Flink and founder of the movement of the same name, wants to change that. So Effing Flink is a national movement. Our prime goal is to take Danes uh, that are among the happiest people in the world, but also being the friendliest people in the world. Why are we doing this? Well, because friendliness and positive human interaction means so much to us. Science shows us that. And so we're, we're trying to do that in all sectors and all realms that we can think of. Wow, that's interesting. Oh, it's really cool. I haven't heard of any, but I, I know that in Denmark, it's it's kind of a thing that you don't really talk to strangers much. It's You don't really just have acquaintances. Like if you meet someone in whatever social group you're in, then like that that's a friendship and it's, it's kind of hard to make friends out there. But um, I haven't heard of anyone trying to change that before. That's very interesting. Is I don't know if it said where he was from, um, the person who was just talking. Did uh, Maybe I'll watch afterwards to see. But I wonder if he's originally from Denmark or if he's from somewhere else, kind of trying to bring that in. That's very interesting. Hmm. Finland and Denmark both have populations of less than 6 million people. The US has over 330 million people. The Nordic countries yeah. are pretty homogeneous too. Do population size and diversity affect happiness? A lot of countries with relatively homogeneous population similarities uh, among people ethnically or in terms of religion and so on are not very happy. So it's no guarantee. 
And on the other hand, it's mm. possible to have a lot of diversity and more happiness. Uh, our northern neighbor in the United States, Canada, ranks higher. Yeah, I think that Finland is probably one of the most homogeneous countries in Europe. Still, we have recently had quite a lot of immigration, but I would say that still it is fairly homogeneous. Hmm, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they'll kind of go more into it because I love like diversity. I love having people from all over the world. I love hearing people's stories. It's it's interesting having people who look different, you know, all around. Like it's, I love that. So that that is kind of interesting. I wonder how much that actually affects happiness or if it doesn't really matter, but. I think it's funny because I kind of always, I guess, assumed that the Danish society was kind of diverse, but then we went to see Dave Chappelle's show here in, in Copenhagen, and both him and the guy who he had with him as support kind of opened their show saying Denmark is so white, and I never really thought about that before, but then ever since that show, I just think about it all the time. <laughs> yeah. We've been having immigration for hundreds of years from all over Europe. I mean, in, in the 70s, we had a lot of people from, from Turkey coming up, from, from Vietnam. Um, we had people from Yugoslavia in, in the 90s, and Denmark has remained uh, happy throughout that period. The 2018 World Happiness Report explores happiness among natives and immigrants. It shows that when immigrants are happy, the countries are too. But if the country is already happy, new immigrants will experience increased happiness. It shouldn't uh, undermine uh, happiness in the Nordic countries that there are influx of, of people born abroad. There's also a dark side to happiness. Like in Denmark, one of the biggest epidemics right now is stress and people being sick with stress and having to leave their jobs. And people outside of Denmark didn't really understand what that meant, like what do you mean stress leave? But it might be that expectation to have a work-life balance here that stresses people out that you... I didn't mean to press that yet, hold on. You also have to work, but you also have to take care of your family, you also have to be social with your friends, you also have to, you know, do this self-realization thing, hobbies and traveling, and you, there's so much you have to do in the same amount of hours, whereas maybe in New York or other places, you know that you're going to work to 10 every day, so you don't expect to have the same <laughs> balance, you know? That's really interesting! That it seems like it, in some places, the stress of trying to not be stressed is stressing people out. That's fascinating because when you have the expectation of, oh, I, I really should be able to spend more time with my family, kind of like what she was saying, that makes people, oh my gosh, more stressed. That's interesting because here... It's like totally fine if you just want to dive into your work and not have a social life and not do anything else. Like, we're just like, cool, you have a lot of money, like good for you type thing. They're kind of awkward or they don't really have a lot of friends, but man, they have a good life. That's interesting. Huh. It can be hard for outsiders to break into the Nordic cultures. The Danes have such tight-knit friend and family groups, it's not very natural for them to just include people, new people, into their, into their groups. It is a little harder when you come in from the outside to um, sort of become part of that group. We've had some, some great uh, Danish friends, some met at work, but uh, it's, it is harder, I think, from that, on that side compared to the UK and the US in terms of developing friendships. There can be serious side effects to maintaining high levels of happiness. Within the States, if you look at the level of life satisfaction, the higher the life satisfaction, actually also the slightly higher the level of suicide rates. Uh, and the theory here is that it might be more difficult to be unhappy in an otherwise happy society because it creates a stronger contrast to how you are feeling if you are surrounded by, by very happy people. So Denmark actually used to have really high suicide rates. So in 1980, we had suicide rates of around 
40 per 100,000, which was, um, I think, some of the highest in the world. Now, fortunately, it's around 25% of that, so it's around 10 per 100,000. South Korea and Lithuania have some of the highest suicide rates in the OECD as of 2017. So fortunately, oh. suicide rates have been reduced a lot uh, in Denmark. Uh, also in, in, in Finland, there's also been a great reduction over the past few decades, but, of, but still it's not zero. Uh, so, so we still need to reduce that uh, even further. Despite mental health challenges, a big part of Finnish culture focuses on overall well-being. Sauna is a sacred thing for Finns. I have like so many good memories about having these sauna moments with my family. That, okay, I feel like they went over suicide rates so fast. I was like, can we talk more about that? Oh my gosh. Like, I did not know. I would not have guessed that suicide rates in like Denmark and Finland were higher for a long time than in the US. Like, what? That's interesting. Um, but I'm glad that they brought that down, but that is, that's really fascinating. I want to learn more about that. That is a, not, you know, a light subject. Wow. Sauna is something that I suppose you kind of have to like and love as a Finn. As of 2018, there were 5.5 million people living in Finland and around 2.3 million saunas. My grandmother always used to tell us kids that we can't fight in the sauna because we then we would risk angering the sauna elf. <laughs> what? Is that like the... But I'm trying to think of something similar. Oh, that's so funny. And there's even, even a sauna in the government of Finland where they say that they make some of the most important political compromises because you're culturally not allowed to fight in the sauna. Danes have mastered the art of comfort and coziness through hygge. I think the best short uh, definition of what hygge is is uh, the art of creating a nice atmosphere. And of course, that is something that happens everywhere. Uh, but what is uniquely Danish is we have a word that describes that situation. You can curl up on a couch and read a good book and have good music on and, and just be in a hygge kroll, which actually means a hygge corner of your room. There's a, a, a social component to hygge, which I think is really important. Wow. OK, I feel like I need an individual video for all of these points that they're covering for like 30 seconds. I'm like, what? 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 <laughs> Pretty cool. I love saunas, but I didn't know that it was apparently like a very cultural thing over there. That's cool. Hygge seeps everywhere throughout the country, from cozy drinks to warm lighting. So one concrete manifestation of Hygge is the focus on lighting. The rule of thumb is the, the warmer the light, the more hygge the light. So Danes love candles. So how does Hygge contribute to happiness? So happiness is both having a strong sense of purpose in life. It's also experiencing moments of pleasure on a daily basis. It's also feeling satisfied with life overall. So Hygge is this element in our daily lives where we experience comfort and, and, and pleasure and togetherness. And hopefully over time that accumulates also to a, a higher uh, sense of, of life satisfaction. Happiness is complicated, isn't it? It's really interesting. And it's probably slightly different for everybody as well. But like they have all these different components that all combined, you know, equal to happiness. It's really interesting. Another way Denmark and Finland support their citizens? Paid annual vacation. So in all Nordic countries, everybody has a right to paid annual vacation. It varies a little by country, but in Finland, for example, it's typically after you work uh, one year for the same employer, it's four weeks in the summer and one week in the winter, and everybody gets this. I actually heard a statistic, it's something like, when Americans go home after work uh, October 27th, you guys have worked as much as Danes will work uh, for the entire year. But I actually think that taking a little more time off also makes you a, a lot more productive. In Finland, it's traditional to spend the summer in a summer cottage, or mukki. We, we did have a summer house when I was little. It was uh, something that my, my grandfather built himself <laughs> during the 60s, I think. 
and we used to go there like all the time when I was small. A week doesn't go past, past uh, during the summer when I'm not thinking like, oh, I wish we still had it. Traditionally, the Mökkis wouldn't have necessarily electricity or, or running water. And usually most Mökkis come with a lake or the Baltic Sea. You can go to, to your sauna and have a dip in the water. So in a Nordic country, the vacation time also serves families that if the parents stagger their vacations a bit, they can handle much easier the summer vacations for their children. And of course, then the family can spend time together. That's a fair point. It's like, how much time do you want to spend, you know, with your kids without them going to school or without, I don't know. That's funny. Um, I do think it's interesting. I, I love the idea of going on a vacation to relax. I feel like even, um, you know, when we take a vacation, and this is probably everywhere as well, but especially like, I feel like my family here in the US, and when we take a vacation, it's like, we pack everything in. Like we go on vacation to go to Disneyland and we go, 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 go. We make sure that we do everything we want to do and like, don't sleep in, we gotta go to Disneyland. And when, when me and my husband went to Hawaii, it was like, okay, what do we wanna do today? We did try and relax a lot more and that was really nice. But I feel like it's a little more rare to go on a vacation to just like chill, to just chill in a lake or just sit on a porch. I feel like we don't do that very much. And maybe that's just us, and maybe that's something we should change. But I feel like when I get back from a vacation, I need a vacation from my vacation because it was so tiring. I don't know if that's very good. So this is cool. Uh, maybe Finnish happiness is more like inside, you know, it's like an inner peace or, or something mm -hmm. like that, that. It's not so open. Yeah. It's like a balance. It's more balance, I think. So, ready. <laughs> Ultimately, happiness is relative. If you think you're having more sex than your neighbor, then you're happier. We are social beings, we compare ourselves to each other. So there are social comparisons in salary, in terms of uh, the houses and how successful we believe we are, uh, but also in, in terms of sex. So what's one small way we can be happier today? For Have me, sex. <laughs> something that I've done which has made me Happier is exercise. I think the saying no or being a tiny bit more selfish can make you happy. One step to improve your sense of happiness is go first. So you're walking down the street, someone else comes walking towards you. It might be just a smile. It might be just looking the other pe person in the, in the eye, oh. whatever it is. But go first with that because you can't expect that the other person is going to do it. Don't be reactive, go first. I thought he meant like, go first in line, or like, if, if you run into someone, make sure you go first before them. Okay, I'm glad that he didn't say that. I would have been like, what? In, in Denmark, we, we sometimes talk about the ABC for mental health. If you want to boost your mood, three sort of universal tips is doing something active, doing something together with other people, and doing something meaningful. So gather a group of friends, go for a walk. That could be something that could boost uh, your mood. Predicting uh, the future on this is uh, very difficult, unfortunately. Where will the U.S. be? It could be even worse than now. It could be much better than now. It's a matter of actually making choices for a better direction for the country and one that is not guided by fear and hate, but one that is uh, guided by a sense of community and the common good. Yeah. And based on education and knowing things. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Um, I liked that. That was very interesting. I feel like that covered so many points. I feel like you guys are going to have so many different kinds of comments and I'm really excited. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to kind of learn more about each individual thing as well. Um, but yeah. That's, it's fascinating. It, it seems like um, people have a little more of a realistic view of happiness in these countries versus the US. Um, in the US, it kind of seems like, you know, we have the American dream, you know, go get that money, build your success and, and then you'll be happy type thing. But it's like here, people are kind of like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a balance. 
you know, of work and family. And, you know, you don't need much. You just need a good balance. And I think that's really cool because I feel like we can really prioritize things in the most insane way. I know that I can. So that's wonderful. Um, definitely, you know, put your comments below. Let me know if you'd like me to react to any other videos that might stem off of this video. Um, I'd like to learn a little bit more, but um, thank you so much for watching as always. I'm happy to be back. Sorry I was coughing, you know, every once in a while through the video, but um, I, yeah, that's it. Um, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video. <laughs> Bye.